Let us pray. Merciful God, be present in our speaking and in our hearing. May the meditations of our hearts feed this church and feed your world. Amen. Our bodies, specifically our bowels, compassion, bravery, love, donuts, and the longing for wholeness. These are some of the essential elements of our walk on this earth. Bodies, bowels, compassion, bravery, love, donuts, longing. I'm going to tell you a story. A story that might initially make you slightly uncomfortable, but hang in there. Comic relief takes over in the end. In 2001, while I was serving as chaplain at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, I was newly diagnosed with a kind of cancer called Hodgkin's lymphoma. The diagnosis was confirmed in early February of that year, and I had made the decision to not make a secret out of it with any of my students or my colleagues at the university. Some colleagues had graciously agreed to tell the news to various student constituencies, and I was still feeling pretty emotionally fragile when I told people, so that was a big help. I was okay once they knew. It was the telling of it over and over again, and then, of course, all the questions that sometimes sent me reeling. I had decided, though, that I would tell the campus ministers all together at our monthly meeting. The only one of them who really knew the complete story before then was my closest friend in that group, an Orthodox rabbi named Joseph Katz. I began the meeting with a brief heads up that I was going to share something painful and serious with them, and then I proceeded to give them the details. I was actually feeling pretty strong and upbeat that particular morning, having at last wrapped my brain around all that was to come in the immediate future. I had confronted and to a degree accepted that months of chemo, radiation, and fatigue were about to happen. I had named, at least to myself, the two heaviest burdens were going to be the feeling of isolation brought on by my illness and the constant worry about my children's well-being through it all. As I described what lay ahead for me, this group made up of nearly all male clergy did something that looked almost as if it had been scripted. They each began to tilt their heads from one side to the other. Each of them was bearing the exact same expression of concern and compassion on their faces as they leaned this way or that. I suddenly became overcome with fear. Their expressions made this whole ordeal real once again. That was what had been happening the last few weeks. I would experience pockets of calm and personal strength, and then it would all fly away in a split second as someone would reflect back to me my own fear, either through their words or their expressions. Looking at them, I was terrified. I thought, this must be serious, look at them. I burst into tears and tried my hardest to make it through the remainder of their questions, not to mention the meeting. It was awful, but I muscled my way through it. When it was over, Rabbi Katz and another colleague stayed behind to sit with me a bit, and we broke into the kosher donuts. I looked at them both and said, geez, you guys were killing me this morning. They didn't understand what I meant. I explained to them about what it was like to have their collective concern reflected back to me in unison by a bunch of guys in black. I told them that I might never tilt my head again when someone is sharing a difficult story or circumstance with me. We all had a good laugh about it, and with my appetite restored, finished off the donuts. I tell this story because I experienced a kind of healing then. This loving group of colleagues in ministry ached for me. They couldn't take away what was to be, 
but they could offer compassion, love, very few words, thank goodness, and donuts. They could touch the hurt because I could not hide it or myself from them. Healings are not just about visceral pain or visible hurt. Healing is what we cannot see, but we hunger the most for. Healing brings us to a peaceable place where we are accepted, loved, restored. A place where we feel again whole. Today we hear of this third healing in Mark's Gospel. And Jesus' tone is a bit unsettling and we are left to ponder it. Of course, he is angry at the injustice of leprosy, and it separates and isolates people, and he is angry with the interpretation of the law that requires a statement of cleanliness. And then why doesn't he want the healed man to tell anyone, or does he? This messianic secret, as it is known, has us a bit puzzled. The story is a short one, yet the meaning is expansive. The leper is bearing witness to the compassion of Jesus. This is a kind of compassion that is stoked by a fire that sees the injustice in the leper's isolation. This is the kind of compassion that is risky for Jesus. Things won't be the same for him after he heals this man. He puts himself at risk by even touching him. He will certainly be forced further to the edges of society. The text says, moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. From what we know of Jesus in these miracle stories, how could he not once again take a risk? Pushing the boundaries of what is normal and accepted in society was indeed his usual MO. Some of the scholars tell us that the word is actually not pity. In the original Greek text, the word is Splanknitsomai, and the translation is closer to moved by compassion or to be moved at one's own depths. I would put it moved in one's gut. In fact, the lexicon tells us that Splanknitsomai means to be moved as to one's bowels, hence to be moved with compassion. The bowels were thought of to be the very seat of love and pity. It all lived here, in one's gut. Jesus had a gut reaction. Inspired by Elijah's nudge of Nanan in our first reading from Kings to have a role in his own healing, cleanse himself in the Jordan, to be transformed, So I wonder now about our own gut reactions, our own role in healing. We must get ourselves to the river. The reparative work that the world around us sorely needs is the call made to each one of us to care, to hold, to nurture one another through our hurts, pains, and sorrows. We are here to heal one another. Our pastors can guide us, at times they even hold us up. But the work of restoration must come out of our own hands. We must respond starting from our gut. This is the work of a church rooted in loving compassion that is bravely shared. Our bodies, our bowels, compassion, bravery, love, donuts longing. These are foundational attributes that sustain our Christian community. Mark presses us to see the compassion of Jesus not merely as a matter of temperament but also as a discipleship orientation. Isn't that in fact as believing people what we are called to do to break down barriers, all of them, religious, social, economic, political, between human need in God's liberating mercy. Illness, scary illness, though not only a metaphor, can be thought of as such if we go a bit deeper here. Our world is ill. 
the span between those who have so much, be it power or money, and those who have so little grows wider every day. We can only think of the agony and human suffering in the Horn of Africa in small bits because it's so much bigger than we can possibly absorb. We feel helpless to heal it. The political climate in this country is more than many can stomach. It's hard to find a refreshing, restorative glimmer of truth in the midst of sound bites, salacious statements, and behavior that only seems geared for a 20-second camera clip. The competition for who holds the moral high ground feels more like manipulative rhetoric than any actual prophetic voice. Even on our own campus, we struggle to really see one another beyond our particular barriers that seem to mark achievement in certain ways. If we show weakness, if we are ill in our bodies or in our hearts, we just want it to go away. We do not want to confront it, be informed by it, lest we lose ground. I often listen to students who find themselves physically ill or emotionally broken, and they are frightened of what that means here in this place of such fast-paced days and never-ending demands. I don't have time for this, they say emphatically. I tell them that they are about to get their real education. They hate hearing that. This is not good news. It is not going to help them as they try to keep up or get ahead of their peers, and yet, and yet, they are so very wrong. Our broken moments, our very brokenness itself, allows for us to face our worst fears of isolation, of not measuring up. We feel weak, and yet there is God, breaking through with compassion and an extended hand made real through the divine union or longing that we have in God's ever-present response to us. Theologian Anne Ulanoff writes, this task confronts all of us to deal with what touches us and not avoid it, to collect our missing parts, the neglected and overlooked and banished parts of our inner and outer populations. We are never touched in the abstract, only in the flesh. The marks of our own frown lines, our sleepless nights, our neighborhood crime, our neglected land, our polluted air reveal this truth. God waits in those parts, waits for us to visit the part left in the prison of repression, waits for us to offer some life-giving water to outcast sexual parts, to give food to starving parts. All these bits must be gathered in and nourished. As Lady Julian of Norwich puts it, all must be knit in, must be one with God. Bodies, bowels, compassion, bravery, love, longing, donuts. Jesus instructs the leper to not tell anyone. Some write that Jesus knows that this news will alter his plan so that he will have to go off by himself to hide from hordes of ill people who will quite naturally want to be healed. I wonder, though, if he isn't telling the leper something else. Is he saying, this miracle is not about me, it's about you. You are the gift. You are God's own, and you belong again. Your story makes you. You are treasure. Show the priest. You are transformational. As someone who has battled two serious illnesses over the course of the last 11 years, I can tell you that the urge to go out and be part of the world again after a period of physical, social, and emotional isolation is very strong. When one first becomes ill, it is often the case that you feel as though you're pulled in a direction that you are compelled to resist with a strong and certain urgency. Your good sense tells you that you are sick and in need of help, 
that you must enter into another kind of world that feels set apart from the rest of us, the world of the sick. One can only resist for so long until, again, good sense and biology makes it clearer that sheer will cannot suppress illness. I can completely understand the leper who will not heed Jesus' request to not tell anyone of his healing. He is elated because he is free. Did he tell because he hopes the priests would spread the word about Jesus, or did he tell to rejoice with gratitude in his good fortune, his second chance at life, and rejoin a world whose laws had previously tossed him aside? How could he not share his joy, his gratitude? This is, in fact, what we all must do. We are all broken in some way, be it physical, emotional, social, spiritual. Today, in this very liturgy, we will anoint one another. Let us look to each other with restored eyes, with deep compassion and love. Let us feel it in our gut, the pain of the world. Let us be healers, for indeed Jesus taught us how. My sisters and brothers, God's own hand is in this moment, knowing that we need that touch to be made whole. We will be transformed and as such can only be grateful. As the psalmist writes, Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and may not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. My sisters and brothers, for this we cannot help but say, Amen.